the Battle of Prohorovka is probably the most famous tank battle of the entire Second World War. It was a part of the enormous Kursk tank battle and was fought on the 12th of July 1943. During the Battle of Prohorovka, the panzers of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps would clash with the tanks of the 5th Guards Tank Army. In total, around 800 tanks were pulled into battle that day for an epic tank-on-tank -tank clash. After the 1943 mud season had ended, Hitler wanted to set up a new operation. Hitler's high command opted for a tactical retreat with small but sharp counterattacks on the flanks. Hitler, on the other hand, wanted to attack and the Kursk salient was picked for the occasion. Soviet intelligence had however picked up the word of the possible attack and offences were set up. On July 5, 1943, the Germans started Operation Zitadelle. The Battle of Kursk was on its way in which the German forces were tasked to eliminate a salient at Kursk. To the north, the Germans quickly became bogged down. To the south was the 4th Panzer Army, which was commanded by General Hermann Hoth. The 2nd SS Panzer Corps under General Paul Hauser was a part of that 4th Panzer Army. Their progress was slow but steady. At the end of the first day, the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had broken through the first belt of defences and pushed to the second belt. The Soviets were concerned about the German penetration and General Vatutin, commander of the Voronezh Front, was forced to use his operational reserves. The 3rd Panzer Corps had difficulties on the first day, which resulted in the fact that the 2nd SS Panzer Corps' eastern flank was largely unprotected. At the end of the second day, Soviet reserves in the form of the 5th Guards and Guards tank armies began to move forward. They reached the vicinity of Prohorovka three days later, on the 9th of July. In the meantime, on the 8th of July, Red Army forces hastily counterattacked the SS Panzer Corps without great success. By nightfall of the 8th, German forces had broken through two of the three initial defensive belts. On the 9th of July, the German commanders had a meeting where they agreed that the northern side of the offensive was practically lost and that the main assault had to be shifted to Hoth's 4th Panzer Army. On the end of the same day, Hauser's SS Panzer Corps was ordered to advance towards Prohorovka. The sudden shift of the axis of attack made the Soviets believe that the Germans were bleeding dry. They thought that the Germans were crumbling, but this was far from true. The Soviets quickly set up a new offensive with their newly obtained information. On the morning of the 10th of July, the Germans started their thrust towards Prohorovka. The 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier Division Totenkopf attacked across the river Psell and managed to secure a bridgehead. The 1st SS Panzer Grenadier Division Leibstandarte SS Adolf Hitler managed to capture the Komsomolet State Farm and Hill 241.6. On the right, the 2nd SS Panzer Grenadier Division Das Reich defended the Corps flank against possible armoured assaults. The next day, on the 11th, the Leibstandarte Division managed to move up the Psell Corridor, cross an anti-tank ditch, secure Oktyabrsky State Farm, and they also managed to secure Hill 252.2 before they were checked by the 2nd Tank Corps, which was reinforced by the 9th Guards Airborne Division. The capture of the anti-tank ditch would prove to be very valuable in the battles that were still to come. The Tortenkopf Division further secured its bridgehead across the river Psell and brought tanks across the river. They were stopped by the Soviet 31st Tank Corps, 33rd Guards Rifle Corps, 95th Guards Rifle Division and the 10th Tank Corps. The Das Reich Division lagged behind due to heavy resistance by the 2nd Guards Tank Corps and the 48th Rifle Corps. By the end of the day, the 1st SS Leibstandarte was within 3 km from Prohorovka, but the SS Panzer Grenadier Division found itself in a dangerous position. With both flanks exposed, it was going to be difficult to proceed with the next day's attacks. On the evening of the 11th, both sides prepared for the next day's battle. The Soviets, believing that the Germans were very weak, ordered its 5th Guards Tank Army to prepare for an attack. Hauser of the SS Panzer Corps was aware of the heavy anti-tank defences on the southwest slopes of Prohorovka, making the 1st SS Leibstandarte Panzer Grenadier Division an easy target should they advance. He thus ordered his 3rd Tortenkopf to advance and capture Hill 226.6 instead. That way he could even the front line and move alongside the neighbouring Leibstandarte Division. The hill was very important and once it was captured, the Germans were to move further towards Prohorovka itself. Once the outskirts were taken, it was up to the Leibstandarte and the Das Reich to finish the job and break through the remaining Soviet defences. 
Lieutenant General Rotmistrov, commander of the 5th Guards Tank Army, wrongly believed that his armoured units would be facing large numbers of Tiger tanks. Therefore, he ordered his tanks to move at full speed in order to flank and take out the heavy German panzers. This would, however, bite him in the arse later on in the battle. Rotmistrov's initial plan to take on the 2nd SS Panzer Corps had to be thrown in the bin, as the 3rd Panzer Corps managed to cross the northern Donetsk River at Trozavets during that night. Because of the 3rd Panzer Corps' advance, Rotmistrov was compelled to divide his forces. The German 2nd SS Panzer Corps had 211 operational panzers, 72 assault guns and around 43 tank destroyers to start the Battle of Prokhorovka, 326 in total. Only a handful of those were the famous Tiger Ones. The Soviets with 838 operational tanks had nearly triple the number of tanks. The main thrust of the Soviet armoured push would fall on the 1st SS Leibstandarte Division, which was the most exposed. The 18th Tank Corps, armed with just under 200 tanks, would attack along the Vsail River line, while at the same time the 192 tank strong 29th Tank Corps would attack towards the south of the railway line. Both Soviet tank corps together consisted out of 382 tanks. The majority being T-34s, but T-70s and lend lease Churchill tanks were also used. They would strike the Leibstandart division which could only muster 56 panzers, of which 47 were Panzer IVs, 5 were Panzer threes, and 4 were Tiger ones. These four Tigers fell under the command of the famous Michael Wittmann. The Leibstandarte could also count on 24 Stug assault guns and 20 Marders, bringing the Leibstandarte's total up to 100 tanks, against the Soviet 382. While the 18th and 29th tank corps were to attack the Leibstandarte head-on, a second thrust would strike the flank of the defending 2nd SS Das Reich. The 2nd Guards Tank Corps and 2nd Tank Corps, which could muster some 200 tanks combined, attacked the Das Reich division, which just like the Leibstandarte could only muster 100 tanks of its own. They could deploy 42 Panzer threes, 18 Panzer fours, and 1 Tiger tank. They could also rely upon 27 Stugs and 12 Marder tank destroyers. On the 12th of July 1943, at a quarter to six in the morning, reports of Soviet engine noises reached the headquarters of the 1st SS Leibstandarte Division. At around 6.50 am, members of the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 1 drove the Soviet infantry out of the Strozevoye area. At the same time, members of the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 2 moved forward from the Oktyabrsky State Farm. At 8am, the Soviets started their 30-minute lasting preliminary bombardment, and after the tremendous bombardment, Rotmistrov radioed the words Stahl, 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 and the Soviet attack was on its way. Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army would attack in two waves, the first wave being the biggest with over 400 tanks. In front of Prokhorovka, where the Leibstandarte was positioned, the tanks of the 18th and 29th tank corps rolled down the slopes of the beautiful rolling landscape. On the hulls of the tanks were the men of the Soviet 9th Guards Airborne Division. All along the front, purple flares were shot, indicating a Soviet armoured assault. SS Obersturmführer Rudolf von Ribbentrop, the son of the Reich's foreign minister, moved into action. Von Ribbentrop was the commander of the 6th Company of SS Panzer Regiment 1. The Zester Company was armed with Panzer Falls. His company, consisting of seven Panzer Falls, drove to the lower slope of Hill 252.2. Behind them were the men of the Dritte Bataillon SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 2, under the command of SS Sturmbahnführer Joachim Piper. Moments after von Ribbentrop had set up his tanks, the 29th Soviet tank corps was charging down the hill. Rotmistrov made a big mistake by ordering his tanks to keep moving. This meant that they had to fire on the move, severely decreasing the accuracy. They also lost a sense of good coordination as everything happened at full speed. The German SS Panzer Regiment 1 would take full advantage of that mistake. Three of von Ribbentrop's Panzer IVs were immediately destroyed and after a hectic retreat which lasted most of the morning, von Ribbentrop finally reached friendly lines. With most of the tank support out of the way, the 3rd Battalion SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 2 and the Piper were soon fighting the many T-34s of Major General Kirishenko's 29th Tank Corps. After a gruelling battle with the 31st and 32nd Tank Brigades and the 53rd Motorized Brigade, totaling over 100 tanks, the Panzer Grenadiers of Piper gained the upper hand, 
although they lost a few trenches and a great number of half-tracks. The small German victory at Hill 252.2 was largely due to the fact that the Soviet tanks came crashing down the hill straight towards their own anti-tank ditch. Unable to cross it, the T-34s and T-70s made easy targets for the Pak-40 gunners of the Leibstandarte. A counterattack later on in the day saw Piper's battalion recapture most of the lines they lost. Von Ribbentrop managed to claim 14 tank kills in the firefight, for which he received the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross. The incident at Hill 252.2 and the anti-tank ditch was an important factor while the 29th Tank Corps failed to penetrate the German lines despite the numerical superiority. It was either overconfidence or plain stupidity of the Soviet commanders that led to the deaths of many tanks and tank crew. The tanks had to halt their advance because their own anti-tank ditch created a dangerous situation in which the tanks were forced to halt. It certainly was something that the commanders should have known and should have anticipated. As the path was blocked, the Soviet tank commanders ordered their crews to make a detour. This however played even more in the hands of the Germans, as the many Soviet tanks had to cross the bridge on the main road. In order to cross the bridge, however, the Soviet tanks had to show their sides at the entrenched German Panzer Grenadiers armed with several Pak-40 anti-tank guns. At noon, SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 2 counterattacked and recaptured Hill 252.2 and Oktyabrsky State Farm. Several witnesses describe how they saw over 100 smouldering wrecks on the forward slope of the hill. What seemed to be a walk in the park for the Soviets turned out to be a disaster. On the 12th of July, the 29th Soviet tank corps lost 102 of their initial 212 tanks and assault guns. They also lost just under 2,000 men just over a thousand of them being dead or missing. The battle, however, was far from over, while Major General Kirishenko's 29th Tank Corps was fighting a desperate battle at Hill 252.2, Major General Basharev's 18th Tank Corps was exploiting the ground close to the Psell River between the 3rd Totenkopf and 1st Leibstandarte divisions. This was considered as the weakest link of the German divisions. Leading the Soviet attack were the tanks of the 170th and 181st Tank Brigades. The 110th was kept in reserve. In support were the men of the 32nd Motorized Rifle Brigade and the with Churchill tanks equipped 36th Guards Tank Regiment. As they attacked together with the 29th Tank Corps on their left, the Germans in the trenches were in complete disarray. It became incredibly hard to defend the already weak sector. In order to counter the Soviet thrust of two armoured brigades, four Tigers were sent up from the 13 Compagnie, or 13th Company in English, of SS Panzer Regiment 1. These four Tiger tanks were commanded by SS Untersturmführer Michael Wittmann, who would become famous for his actions at Villebocage. After a three-hour lasting tank-on-tank -tank firefight, the Soviet attack was eventually repelled. The Tiger platoon didn't lose a single Tiger in that engagement. According to the annals of the 18th Tank Corps, 55 out of the initial 190 tanks were completely destroyed. 32 T-34s had been destroyed as well as 11 Churchill tanks and a dozen T-70s. The Tiger tanks and the Wittmann close to Hill 241.6 had a field day, but despite the fact that these open plains were ideal tank terrain, the roles and the landscape did benefit the Soviet tanks of the 170th Tank Brigade to some extent. Several T-34s managed to evade the deadly 88mm fire because of the landscape and they soon reached the Komsomolet State Farm where the Leibstandarte's artillery regiment had set up. After destroying multiple guns and vehicles of various sorts, the attack was repulsed by the German artillerymen firing at point-blank range through open sights. Later on in the afternoon of the 12th, the Tiger tanks of Wittmann were forced to move up in order to engage the surviving tanks of the 181st Tank Brigade. This they did with great results for the German tankers. Nonetheless, one of the Tigers was heavily damaged in the attack and had to be abandoned. It was the only Tiger loss for the 13th Company throughout the campaign. We have now covered most of the Battle of the Leibstandarte Division and the 18th and 29th Tank Corps, but the battle also raged on the eastern side of the railway line. Soviet armour of the 31st Tank Brigade and 53rd Motorized Brigade, both units of the 29th Tank Corps, broke through the German Recce Battalion and reached the Komsomolet State Farm, threatening the Leibstandarte's HQ. 
Due to German Luftwaffe actions, the 31st Tank Brigade was forced to play a defensive role as they couldn't advance further because of the German planes circling above them. The Panzergrenadiere of the SS Panzergrenadier Regiment 1 had dug themselves in at the Stalinsk State Farm. They were unfortunate not to have much tank support as most of the Panzergrenadier Division's tanks were used on the western side of the railway line. The regiment of Panzergrenadiers would soon be up against the tanks of the 29th Tank Corps 25th Tank Brigade. Supporting the 25th Tank Brigade were the members of the 1446th Self-Propelled Artillery Regiment, the 28th Guards Paratroop Regiment and a part of the 2nd Tank Corps 169th Tank Brigade. As the 25th Tank Brigade advanced forward, rapidly closing in on the defending Panzergrenadiers, they were ambushed by several Marder tank destroyers close to the Stalinsk farm. The Germans had also carefully set up their pack 40s at the Storozhevoye woods. The woods offered excellent cover and provided the gunners with an excellent field of vision from where they destroyed several dozens of Soviet tanks. Once again an overconfident Soviet armoured fighting force had been reduced to smouldering wrecks. To the right of the SS Panzer Grenadier Regiment 1 were the men of the 2nd SS Das Reich Division. They were tasked to defend the exposed right flank of its sister division. But just like everywhere on the front line, the 2nd Guards Tank Corps and the 2nd Tank Corps were unable to properly break the Germans and throw them out of their defensive positions. Although the orders of the 3rd SS Totenkopf mention an assault, the Panzer Grenadier Division was at the start of the day too occupied by dealing with the Soviet attack. The Totenkopf 16 SS Panzergrenadier Regiment Theodor Eicher repelled an attack and re established the line, forcing the Soviet tanks to withdraw to the village of Andreevka. After the attack was repulsed, the division could focus once more on the attack, and by the end of the 12th, the Death's Head Division was in control of Hill 226.6, and they had advanced along the northern part of the Tsel River towards the Kartashevka Prohorovka Road. The Soviet forces had suffered incredible losses. Rotmistrov later wrote that his 29th tank corps had lost up to 60% of its armoured forces and the 18th tank corps suffered 30% losses. The 5th Guards tank army had failed to achieve its objectives after their frontal assault had been halted by the tanks of the 2nd SS Panzer Corps. Because of the huge losses Rotmistrov was forced to put his two tank corps on the defence. Reinforced with infantry, the 29th and 18th tank corps dug themselves in and prepared new defences. Opposite the Tortenkopf division, however, the 10th Guards Mechanized Brigade and the 24th Guards Tank Brigade of the 5th Guards Mechanized Corps made preparations to attack the German SS division and pushed them back. Stalin was on the verge of sacking Rotmistrov during a phone call, but he eventually decided not to. The same evening, Stalin ordered Zhukov to Vatutin's headquarters as High Command representative in order to assume the control and coordinating further operations. The 12th of July, due to a close and preparations for the following day were made. Vatutin ordered the Soviet forces under his command to halt any German advance, especially on the northern bank of the Psell River. On the German side, the 3rd SS Totenkopf Division was ordered to consolidate its gains of the 12th and attack the Soviet forces in the side at Prohorovka. The battered 1st SS Leibstandarte Division was ordered to cooperate with its sister division to the north. The 2nd SS Das Reich Division was ordered to strengthen the lines and prepare for an assault to link up with the 3rd Panzer Corps to its right. On the morning of the 13th of July 1943, the Soviet 10th Guards Mechanized Brigade and the 24th Guards Tank Brigade, together with the 95th and 52nd Guards Rifle Corps, launched their attack against the 3rd SS Totenkopf. Because they were attacked, the Totenkopf Division couldn't shift its focus to an advance towards Prohorovka. Instead, they were preoccupied in fending off the Soviet attack. Around noon, the SS Panzer Aufklärungsabteilung 1 moved northwards towards the Psell River in order to strengthen the front line and close the dangerous gap in between the 1st and 3rd SS Panzer Grenadier divisions. The Leibstandarte's Panzers, on the other hand, were shifted towards Oktyabrsky State Farm and Prokhorovka in general. The SS Panzer Aufklärungsabteilung 1 attacked the positions which were defended by the 42nd Guards Rifle Division and the remaining tanks of the 18th Tank Corps. The attacks failed and the Germans were pushed back. During the afternoon of the 13th, the 3rd SS Totenkopf was ordered to retreat back towards Hill 226.6, which was easier to hold. 
The Totenkopf's withdrawal was completed by nightfall, and the Battle of Prohorovka drew to a close. The same day at the Wolfschanze, Hitler summoned Feldmarschall Erich von Manstein in command of Heeresgruppe Süd, and Feldmarschall Günther von Kluge, the commander of Heeresgruppe Mitte, to discuss the state of affairs. With the Allied landings in Sicily, the Soviet counteroffensive of Operation Kutuzov against the German 9th Army on the northern side of the Kursk salient, combined with the hampering progress at Prohorovka, it was finally decided to terminate Operation Citadelle. Von Kluge was happy with the result, but von Manstein persisted that he was within reach of breaking the Soviet defenses at Prohorovka, and demanded that he should be given some more time to at least destroy the Red Army's reserves in the southern part of the salient. Hitler agreed, and thus the fighting continued in the southern part of the salient for a couple more days. Although these days were spent playing a defensive role by both sides. The losses on both sides are incredibly hard to establish. The Germans held the area for some time after the battle, which meant that they could retrieve knocked out tanks and repair them. The Germans would eventually retreat on the 17th of July 1943. Most of the time, only vehicles which couldn't be repaired anymore were listed as losses. The Leibstandarte Division lost five Panzers as a result of the 12th of July's battle. These five tanks were the Panzer IVs lost in von Ribbentrop's company and the Tiger of Wittmann's platoon. The German 2nd SS Panzer Corps reported 842 soldiers killed, wounded and missing for the 12th of July. The Zweizer SS Panzer Corps have wrongly mentioned in the same report that they didn't lose a single tank. Other sources have mentioned that around 40 tanks were either knocked out or damaged during the fighting on the 12th of July. The 5th Guards Tank Army made a document listing the losses from the 12th of July to the 16th of July 1943. The document mentioned the following. 222 T-34s, 89 T-70s, 12 Churchill tanks, 8 SU-122s, 3 SU-76s, and 240 support vehicles. All these are irrecoverable. Another 212 tanks and self-repelled guns were under repair. The same report also mentions that the tank army lost 2,940 men killed in action, 3,510 wounded, and 1,157 missing soldiers. This would mean that a total of 334 Red Army tanks were irrecoverably lost, compared to a maximum of 40 German tanks. As of the outcome of the Battle of Prohorovka on the 12th of July, there is still some debate. The Germans indeed managed to knock out a lot of Soviet tanks in the area, but they never reached their objective Prohorovka. The Soviet industry could also manage to replace the losses within a short period of time. The Red Army managed to hold the German attacks, but they didn't achieve their ultimate goal of destroying the 2nd SS Panzer Corps. For the Germans, however, the loss of the experienced tank crew would prove to be much greater than the actual Panzer losses themselves. Neither the 5th Guards Tank Army nor the 2nd SS Panzer Corps achieved their objectives for the 12th of July. This was the Ace Destroyer. I hope you enjoyed this documentary about the extraordinary Battle of Prohorovka during the Kursk campaign. If you did, you can always subscribe to my channel or leave a like on the video. You can always leave something in the comments. Cheers!